So it's been a minute since I last posted, but in the interim, I've managed a trip to Las Vegas with a group of friends. Now, I know when a lot of you travel, you pack a ton of books to read, but frankly, the last thing I want to do when I'm in Vegas is read, or sleep for that matter. So in the interim, I've suffered a bit of a, let's not call it a slump, just a lull. But I have managed to finish Eugene Grace Wirtz's Everything Belongs to Us. And it's a fascinating spin on a familiar story. It's three friends setting off to university, in this case, Seoul National in 1978. Um, Namin comes from a poor family who's focused their entire lives and most of their income to her schooling to allow her to succeed. Uh, Jisun comes from incredible wealth and privilege and is doing her best to distance herself from that. And Sunam is caught in the middle. He's really just trying to find his footing in the world. This is like a CW drama set in South Korea. The writing is fine and there are moments of just shattering devastation. Taken in terms of just the story alone, it is perfectly serviceable fare. But of course, reading and reviewing is such a personal thing. And there was all this subtext that really resonated for me. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the larger context of the story and why it seemed to work so well for me. I've been thinking a lot about university with our daughter heading off to university in the fall. Now, hers was an experience probably familiar to you as a Canadian and probably lots of you in the United States. She was concentrating her marks in high school with an eye towards staying on top of her prerequisites knowing she was going into the STEM field. We visited a half a dozen different university campuses and from there she submitted an application to three, her top two choices with a third safety pick. Now, as a result of her marks, she got early acceptance and scholarships to all three that she applied for. So that meant additional campus tours for her top two choices, but this time with an eye towards looking at the residences, the cafeteria, internet speeds, the campus vibe, and the surrounding city. All these factors that come into play above and beyond the actual program itself. Things are a little different in South Korea. From elementary school right through to high school, students are singularly focused on their education. As university looms ever closer, a typical student spends 10 hours a day in class, comes home for a quick meal, and then heads out to a private educational institution called a hagwon. They've recently had to implement a curfew of 10 p.m. because students were staying out well past that at these study institutes. And it is a big deal. In 2014, Koreans spent 18 billion in private education. Now, that wasn't always the case. After World War II, less than 5% of the adult population had anything more than an elementary school education. With a concerted government effort in less than 50 years, that has turned into 90% of students graduating from high school and 70% of them going on to university. When going to university is a little different in South Korea. On the second Thursday of every November, Cities all across South Korea essentially shut down as over 600,000 students proceed to write the Sunyong, or the College Scholastic Ability Test. Um, businesses open later to keep cars off of the road. Airplanes are essentially grounded at airports. Construction halts at nearby sites, and even heavy trucks are prevented from driving on nearby roads. Police are available to provide escorts for students running late to write their exam. Parents are not allowed on the campuses, but crowd nearby temples and ring university campuses, holding their prayer and candle vigils. It is an eight-hour exam that determines the rest of your life. Students are striving for acceptance at the Sky Universities, at Seoul National, Korea, and Yonsei Universities. Only 2% of the students actually do get in, but once they do, they are all but set and guaranteed a lucrative job once they graduate. Some even say that marriage prospects are tied to the quality of school that you get into. Maybe you don't do as well, and you get accepted at a second or a third tier university. Your job prospects suffer as well. Maybe you blanked or whiffed on the test entirely. Too bad. You have to wait an entire year before you can take the test again. So that makes South Korea probably the best standardized test takers in the world. Conversely, out of 30 developed countries, they rank at the absolute bottom in terms of student happiness. Results are posted about a month later, although nowadays it happens within hours online. When I was there, in the small village I was in, they were posted on a bulletin board in the community center. The place was mobbed with students checking out to see how they've done. Now, as you can imagine, with such intense pressure on that exam, there was a rash of suicides immediately following, with students performing poorly. Strangely, there is also a high incidence of mothers committing suicide, having lost face when their children perform poorly on that exam. So yeah, that is some 
really intense pressure. I can only imagine my own high school experience supplanted into that of South Korea. I, I think my pets would have had to commit Harry Carey over the subsequent shame, and I'd frankly be working in a sweatshop showing t-shirts for Kathy Lee Gifford. So when Eugene Grace Wirtz says Naman's family were focused on her success, that is an understatement. Families invest a significant portion of their income on private education. Some will even borrow heavily to prepare their children for the Sun Young. Um, and so that is the weight on the student's shoulders that is ingrained in the culture. Now, once you're in, things change a little bit. On the way up to writing the exam, no one cares what you're passionate about, what you're into, what you want to be when you grow up. It's a singular focus on taking that test. But once that's behind you, you can start relaxing a little bit and trying to figure out who you are as a person. In North America, that might mean becoming a strident SJW and having loud, passionate conversations about triggers, politics, intersectionality, and cis scum. And I don't mean to be dismissive, but there is a performative aspect to that that tends to mellow with age. Well, the same goes for South Korea. I remember visiting a campus while I was in Korea, and it was bizarre. The students had pulled desks out of the classrooms and were piling them up along the paths, and wheelbarrows were filled with broken pave stones. Suddenly, the police arrived, and the scene erupted. Stones were being pelted at the police, who were wearing body armor, holding riot shields, Molotov cocktails, it appeared, shattered glass, flames at the foot of the police officers. That pile of desks was lit alight in a huge bonfire. Just mayhem. And then eventually the police shot tear gas into the crowd. I was caught in the crossfire and just my face exploded. I could barely see. I made the mistake of going to a water fountain to try and wash my face off, which just blew my head up entirely. It felt like I was breathing fish bones. The students around me seemed oblivious to it, already prepared with toothpaste on their face, wearing balaclavas, but I got the hell out of there. Now, when my head finally calmed down, I returned to the campus a few hours later and all was quiet. Everything had been cleaned up. The desks had been removed. All the broken glass and rocks had been swept up. Aside from a few charred bushes, there was no evidence that a demonstration had just occurred a few hours earlier. It was very strange. Less than a month later, I found myself in the city court and I saw the police gearing up, putting on their armor, getting their riot shields. By the time I had reached the university, it was the same scene all over again. Piles of desks, wheelbarrows filled with broken rocks. So this time I paid a little bit more attention. I noticed the nearby shops shuttered their stores before the police arrived. There was a lone person with a huge telephoto lens off in the distance taking pictures. I can only assume that of the students so they could be identified later, but for all I knew, he worked for the yearbook. And the students, actually, I was watching them. Those not directly involved with the demonstration seemed a little disgruntled, a little put out that they would have to take a different path to their economics 101 class because there was a giant pile of burning furniture in their way. It was almost like a football game, business as usual. The next month this happened again, but this time I managed to find a student to explain to me what the hell everyone was demonstrating about. It was because the South Korean government was suppressing a North Korean movie on salt, of all things. But an intrepid student had managed to smuggle a copy of the movie that we were all going to watch later. Same thing, Molotov cocktails, burning furniture, rocks, etc. And then I found myself in a tiny school gymnasium, shoulder to shoulder with other students, as I'm watching a lone Asian at the front of the auditorium fiddling with a VCR, unable to get the movie to play. And I thought, this is just ridiculous. And a single tear gas grenade in this place, and someone is going to die. So I managed to squeeze myself out of there and not look back. Of course, that was in a small rural community at a third-tier university. I'm sure things got way more intense than the nation's capital. I've seen photos of protests there where a Korean bit off the end of his own finger so he could write in blood on his white parka. That kind of intense. What I saw was basically the farm team working on protest fundamentals. All right, we've got to rein it in a little bit. I leave for a while and I go rambling on and on. So... Everything Belongs to Us really hit a few familiar chords for me. University has definitely been on my mind. I hope my daughter has much more of a Western experience at university that includes more beer pong and remembering to FaceTime her parents once in a while and to not get too stressed about it all. So that's it. I hope you all have a great week of reading and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.